Thank you, everybody. My name is Ali Sivji. I'm going to be talking to you about data science workflows using Docker containers. I tried my best to put in as many buzzwords as I could in the title. <laughs> Did a pretty good job, I think. I'll just a little FYI, I tweeted a link to the slides. There's also going to be links at the end. So if you want to follow along, you know where to look. Also, just a little about me before we get started. I just started my first Python job two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working as a software engineer at a company called Analyte Health. We're trying to change healthcare delivery models on the testing side, like laboratory testing side. Uh, I got a couple coworkers here, so thanks guys for coming out and supporting me. It means a lot. I'm also a grad student at Northwestern. I'm studying medical informatics. I like Python, I like data, and I love Star Trek. So what are we going to be talking about today? I'm going to start by giving an overview of data science for some context. We'll learn about Docker and learn about containers. And then we'll walk through some Docker-based data science workflows. What is data science? Data science is about extracting value from data. It's about turning your data into actionable insights. And this can mean many different things. We can visually explore our data. We can build predictive models. We can classify observations into groups based on similar characteristics. Or we can build data-driven applications. So first and foremost, we have to remember that data science is a science. We have a question that we want to answer, a hypothesis of why something is happening. And our output is not just our findings. It's, all the, it's also the steps we took to get to our result. And so what this really means is that reproducibility is really important. And our analysis, it needs to be repeatable. Reproducible workflows in data science make it easier to communicate results. We can use our methodology to tell a story when we go and present our findings. Reproducibility also makes it easier to defend decision making. If we produce the same answers over and over again, it's less about gut instinct and a lot more about data-driven insights. And finally, if we have reproducible workflows, other people can go in and audit our work to ensure that it's correct and that it complies with regulations. My last job, I used to work with healthcare data. And one of the things we needed to make sure was we never let patient data leak in any of our models. So this is just a really good overview of the data science process. We start by asking an interesting question, like, what are we trying to do? The next step is to start gathering data to answer that question. This phase is probably going to involve us transforming data from a format we're storing it in into a format we can actually use for analysis. Next, we'll do some EDA. Then we'll start building this model, fitting the model, and then, training, and then tuning the model. And finally, we'll communicate our results through a presentation, a blog post, or a paper. So Python has a really great ecosystem of data science tools that make it easy for us to do analysis. And Jupyter, Jupyter's sort of the star of the show. Jupyter's our data science front end we can use to capture our process. So Jupyter notebooks are documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and explanatory text. So here's a picture I got from uh, the Project Jupyter website. So you can see we have a block of text, some formulas, a live code block, uh, interactive sliders, and some visual output. And we can use all of these as building blocks when we're going to document our data science methodology. And we can also pass these notebooks around when we want to share results with colleagues. But not so fast. Jupyter notebooks suffer from one problem, and that's the it works on my machine problem. In order for our, in order for our notebooks to work, we're going to need the data plus all the dependencies that were used to reproduce that data. And this is where Docker's going to come in. Docker's going to help us solve the problem of it works on my machine. So Docker's a platform that allows us to package and run applications in loosely isolated environments that we call containers. We can use the shipping container analogy to understand how Docker works. So shipping containers standardize the logistics industry. It didn't really matter what was inside these containers. We can send them by boat, by train, or by truck. And we have the infrastructures at all these various facilities to handle these standardized containers. 
With Docker, we can package our code plus everything we need to run the code in an isolated container. And since these software containers are standardized, we can pass them into different environments without having to worry if they're going to run or not. So this does sound really similar to virtual machines, but there are a couple of key differences. The first is that containers run natively on the host machine's OS. That is, they share the same kernel as the host machine. And for virtual machines, we have a hypervisor. And this, hypervi this hypervisor provides each VM with virtual access to the host's resources. So what this means is for containers, we really don't need full-scale operating systems. So they're going to be a lot more lightweight and have better performance characteristics. So we can use Docker for many different things, such as streamlining our development workflows, if we want to do some continuous integration or some continuous deployment. We can use Docker to build out microservices. And of course, we can use Docker to do some reproducible data science. So this is a really great overview of the Docker architecture. We have the Docker client, and that's where we enter in commands to interact with Docker. And these commands, they go to the Docker host. And this host can be running either on your local machine or a remote machine. The host needs to be running the Docker daemon. And since Docker daemon is going to intercept commands from our client, it's going to manage Docker objects like containers, like images, and it's also going to communicate with other Docker daemons. And then we have the Docker registry, and that's where we store Docker images. Docker Hub, that's like GitHub. It's the public registry. So there you're going to find a lot of public Docker images for things like Linux distributions, databases, and Python has a bunch of uh, images as well. So an image is a frozen snapshot of a container. And each image cons uh, consists of a set of read-only layers that are stacked on top of each other. And each layer is the set of differences from the layer below it. And containers, containers are the runtime instance. When we create a container, what we do is we add a thin read-write layer called a container layer to the top of our image layer stack. And then anytime we add a file, modify an existing file, or delete a file, all of that's going to be done in the top read-write layer, that top container layer. This is really similar to the principles of object-oriented programming, where images are like classes, layers are akin to inheritance, and containers are runtime instances, just like objects are runtime instances of a class. We can create Docker images two different ways. The first way is by freezing the container using the docker commit command. And what that's going to do, it's going to take that top read-write layer, that top container layer, and make it read only. And then we can take this new image and use it to initialize new containers. Or the more preferred way is to use a docker file and the docker build command. So a docker file is a file that contains commands that are used to create an image. And we can automate our build process using the docker build command. Here's just a list of common Docker file commands. We have from, which allows us to set the base image, like what image are we building off of. And here we can use our repo name that we got from Docker Hub. We also have a label to set metadata. We can copy files and directories into an image. And we can also set environment variables and the working directory. The run command is used to execute shell commands in a new layer, and it puts that new layer at the top of the image stack. And just be aware that any time we run a Docker file command, we're going to be creating a new layer. So if you want to say install Jupyter and pandas, then we go run pip install Jupyter, next line, run pip install pandas. That's going to be creating two separate layers. And Docker best practices says that one of the things that we want to do is minimize the number of layers in our images. So we can do this by chaining together commands like we would at the command line. So we can just do a run pip install Jupyter, the double ampersand to chain them together, backslash to go on the next line, pip install pandas, and we're only going to have one layer in that, uh, in that image. We can use entry point and CMD to define what our command should do at runtime, like what shell command should we run when our container launches. There's two ways to put this in. There's the shell form, which is pretty much what we do at the terminal. And there's the exec form, which is the same thing, except it's formatted a little differently. Uh, if you're just starting off, I highly recommend you just use CMD. CMD and entry point do interact really well, but it's a little bit more of an advanced concept. So try to walk before you start running. 
And so here's our hello world Docker file, and I'm actually going to go into the terminal. We're going to play around with some stuff. So here I have two files. I have my Docker file and a hello world py. So let's take a look at the hello world py. So I'm just going to be printing hello world. And now we'll just go in and check out this Docker file. So as I mentioned before, every time we enter in a command, we're creating a new layer. So I'm going to be building off the Python 3.6.3, updated yesterday, the 3.6.3 image. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be setting our working directory. We're going to be copying the contents of our current directory, so the Docker file and the hello world.py file, into our working directory. And then once the container starts, we're just going to run Python on the hello world script. So we can build uh, using the docker build command. We'll tag our image and call it hello world. And we want to specify our docker file is in the current directory. That's where the doc comes in. And there we go. We have our docker file built. So we can look at our docker images using the docker image command. And you see here I built hello world seven seconds ago. And so I can use this image to generate, uh, to initialize a new container. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll just clear that out. So we can do docker run and then the image name. And it's going to go out into the container and run that script. So you see it ran Python's hello world and it printed that. We can take a look at all running containers using the docker ps command. But you're not going to see anything here since this container stopped. So we can look at all stopped containers, the, the process stopped, uh, with the minus a flag. So you see here. We have, um, we have our container ID built off the hello world image. It executes Python hello world, and it has a name, naughty Samit. So we can actually use that name in order to start up that container again. So we can do docker start, minus i to make it interactive, and minus a to connect standard in, standard out, standard error, and then put in our, um, our container name. And there it goes, and it prints it again. Or we can also use the container ID, which is just that hash you see. Uh, so the docker start, and there it goes. Pretty simple, right? And so here I'm just walking through the steps that, uh, that I used to build the image and the steps I used to create a container and then restart that container. So you saw me use the docker run command. That's the command that you're going to use the most. So let's explore that in a little bit more detail. We can use the minus D flag to run it in the background, so run it in detach mode. As I mentioned before, we can attach standard in, standard out, and standard error. We could also make it interactive with minus i. And we could also name our, uh, our container with the double hash uh, name. If we ever want to get into the shell of our container, we can pass in, say, bin slash sh or bin bash after the docker run command to get to that prompt. So just be aware that any time we delete a container, we delete all the data inside the container. So everything in that top read-write layer, that top container layer, it all just goes away. So we should think about different ways we can actually manage our data. So the easiest way to do it is using the docker cp command to copy files in and out of, directory, or out of our containers. But that's going to become a little bit tedious. So the more preferred way is to use a data volume. And so what we'll do is we're going to mount a local folder as a directory inside of our container. And any changes we make to the directory inside of a container, that's going to show up on our local folder since it's only been mounted there. And when we're creating our containers with the docker run command, we can specify our local directory we want to mount and the container path we want to mount to with the minus v flag. We can also add a command to our docker file, a volume command, to specify where our mount point is. But this doesn't really do anything, and it's not really necessary. We only really do it to be explicit about our workflows. We can connect to the outside world fairly easily from containers, but we'll have to set up port forwarding to connect to the inside of containers. So just like before, when we're creating a container, this time we'll use the minus p flag to specify the host port we want to forward. And then we'll specify the container port we wish to expose. And like before, we can also add a command to our Docker file to be a little bit more explicit about our workflow. It doesn't do anything, but it's best to be explicit. Uh, Some more Docker file best practices. I'll stress this one more time. Be explicit about your build process. 
it's a lot easier to, like, to uh, figure out what you did after maybe two, three weeks this, uh, if you didn't have that instruction there. Our container should also be stateless. We should try to avoid, un uh, try to avoid installing unnecessary packages. Each container should only have one concern, and we should minimize the number of layers inside of our image. And uh, if you look at older Docker files, you'll see a maintainer uh, command, but that's actually been deprecated, so try to use label if you can going forward. Let's uh, review the Docker build process, or the Docker container lifecycle process one more time, just to make sure everything is sticky in our head. We have a Docker file. We can build an image using the Docker build command. From that image, we can create a container with Docker run. I didn't mention kill, but if we want to kill a running container, we can do docker kill container name. And what that's going to do, it's going to send a sig kill to the process inside of that container. We already talked about starting a stop container, but if we ever want to delete a container, we can do docker rm container name. And if we want to delete the image, we can do docker rmi container image. So here's just a list of uh, docker commands for containers. I put stars next to the ones I use more than others. And here's the same thing, but for images. Uh, so more tips and tricks. Smaller images are better. Only install the things you need. Maybe you should look into some other Linux distributions, like Alpine Linux. That's only five megabytes total. We can also mount symbolic links as volumes inside of our container. And if we're ever running a process, make sure you set the IP address to 0.0.0.0. If you use 127.0.0.1, that's actually going to be a loopback interface, and we're not going to be able to connect to the inside of that process. Unfortunately, we had to learn that the hard way. So now the reason we're all here, we're going to learn how to do some data science with Docker. Just be aware that these are suggestions. You can do these a, a billion different ways. Uh, just so use these as suggestions. Nothing really set in stone. Here's a template for you to use. So imagine you have a Jupyter notebook you want to share. This could be a thesis, a project deliverable, or analysis you want to send to a colleague. But Jupyter suffers from that problem we talked about before, the it works on my machine problem. So why don't we create a Docker image with a library, data, and notebooks that are required to reproduce the calculations and push up that image to Docker Hub. And let's go back to the terminal and uh, play around with this. So here you see we have a Docker file, a data folder, and an iris analysis IPython notebook, or Jupyter notebook, sorry. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at that uh, Docker file. So here I'm building off the Python 363 slim image, uh, setting my metadata, setting my working directory, copying all the contents of my current directory, into that working directory, so the, uh, the Jupyter Notebook and the data folder. I'm going to pip install some libraries, so NumPy, Pandas, Seaborn, sklearn, Jupyter. We're going to expose the port, be explicit about that, 8888. And when we get inside the container that launches, we're going to run Jupyter Notebook, set the IP address, our port, since we're inside of a container, we don't need a browser. And also, since we're in a container, we're going to be root. We just need to turn that flag on to make sure we can actually run it. I'm not going to build this because it's going to take some time to download the dependencies. But like a cooking show, I did this do a little. I did do this a little earlier. <laughs> so we have our workflow number one. So we can go Docker run. We want to connect the ports. So I'm going to make it 99.99 on my local machine. And we're forwarding the Jupyter running instance of 8888. And that's going to be our, uh, our, our image name. And there you go. It uh, loaded up this, uh, this process inside of the container. So now let's just go copy that token. Oh, sorry, it's 99.99. Yeah. And so you see we have our iris analysis and our data folder. So let's open this up just to make sure everything looks good. You guys know it. All right, uh, so I'm reloading all the libraries. 
on my local machine, I have Python 3.6.1. Yes, I know I'm a dinosaur. Uh, when I reload it, it's Python 3.6.3 like we had inside that container we specified. And now we can just go on and load our data, do a little bit of exploration, some exploratory data analysis. And at the bottom, I have some SK learn stuff. So let's just make sure that also, ran, oh, that also runs. And here I'm just doing like an SVM or SVC fitting on the Iris data set. And you can see everything works like normal. So everything's inside the container, so you can just pass this around and it shouldn't be a problem. Just walking through the steps I did. And now we have our container. Let's go ahead and upload it to Docker Hub. So this process is really simple. We have our image name. We can just Docker push full image name, and it'll put it in our repo. And then we can have instructions for our users to Docker pull our repo, and then use instructions from the, the previous slide in order to initialize our container and then restart the container as required. So those of us who work on a team know how hard it is to set up a standardized development environment across everybody on the team. Or if you've ever accidentally updated a dependency and had everything break, you know how important it is to keep all your development environments isolated. So this is where workflow number two is going to come in. And I call this the data science project. So what we're going to do is we're going to create our development environment inside of a container. And then we're going to mount a data volume so we can do work uh, with persistent data on our local machine. So the benefits of this are we can separate out projects. If we want to onboard a new employee, they can just spin up a container. And if we ever have to upgrade dependencies, say Pandas releases an updated version, we can use that. Uh, we can check that new version in our automated testing pipeline. We're all testing, right? Of course. All right, cool. Yeah. So let's actually go ahead and go back to the terminal and play around with this. So here I just have a Docker file. And so I'm just going to take a look at that Docker file. So this time I'm going to be building off the Miniconda image. And Miniconda is just Python with the Conda installer. Conda is really popular for data science, so I thought it'd be really fitting for this example. We'll just add some metadata, set our working directory, install some libraries, make sure we clear up our cache, expose the port, and create a mount point. And then as before, when we get inside the container and it launches, we'll run our Jupyter Notebook command like before. So I did, this, I did do this a little earlier as well, so you can just see it right here. So we'll do docker run minus p to connect our ports. Let's use 9999 again. But this time, we're going to be mounting a directory. And uh, what I have, uh, where is this folder? I have a folder on my local machine where I sort of store some of my data science work. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and mount that. And I'm going to be mounting to slash app. See, that's why it's good to be explicit, because just in case you forget. And then we're going to need our Docker image name. And we should be good to go. So you see I have this token. Let's go ahead and open that up in a browser. And you can see here we have the same directory structure as we had inside of that directory on my local machine. So you can go ahead and open up your work and uh, maybe share it on a network drive so everybody has the same, uh, the same code. And this is just walking through the build process, initializing the container, restarting the container. Uh, so workflow number three is what I call the data-driven application. And this is going to simplify our deployment process. We've all had to manually deploy apps before. We run our test in dev. If it works, move it to prod. Run our test again in prod, just because we don't sure. <laughs> Not really the most efficient way of doing things. But with this, we can uh, pass around our containers and know that it's actually going to run. So for my workflow, I'm gonna, I have data on my local machine, and I'm going to create and package a dashboard inside of my container. And then every time I start my container, I can go to a URL and look at my dashboard. 
Let's go back to the terminal. So here I have a plot time series file. This is just a, a dashed uh, script. You can take a look at that later. This is all on my GitHub. I have a requirements file, so we can just take a look at that. And here's just all the requirements that are used to, uh, to reproduce that dash, uh, that dash dashboard. And then we also have a Docker file. Here I'm building off the Python 363 Alpine image setting some metadata, setting my working directory, copying the contents of my, working, of my current directory into that working directory, uh, pip installing my requirements file that I just put into that image, exposing the port, and I'm gonna create a mount point at slash app slash data. And then this time I'm gonna use entry point to say Python is my default executable, and I'm gonna pass in the parameter plot time series to run that one script. If I had another dashboard, I could also pass it around, pass that dashboard, uh, sorry, pass that, uh, that parameter in and run a separate dashboard if I so choose at that time. So let's go ahead and uh, get this one going. So we could go to Docker images. So this one has been pre-built. I'll just show you guys one more thing. I'm, uh, I've been generating data since I got here every two seconds, I think. It's generating a number between one and four. So we can just take a look at that. So yeah, you see right here? Yeah, that's right, all right. Uh, so it's going to do that, and then uh, we can just go ahead and run that, run this container to make sure it works. So Docker run, connect the ports. This one will just use the standard ports. Mount my directory, this is the local part. And this is gonna be at app slash data. Why don't we give this one a name? We'll call this dashboard. Thank you. My dashboard? All right, there we go. <laughs> All right. And I'm just gonna copy in our image name. And there we go, we have our dashboard up and running. So let's go to that URL. Oh, sorry, next time. <laughs> Can we edit the script? All right, a little later. So you can see here we have a live dashboard that's updating with live data. So let's, thank you. So let's, uh, let's actually make sure this is working. Uh, so I have another script which generates data every half a second. <laughs> and you can already, well, you can't see it yet. You can see already the, the, the points are a lot closer together. So instead of doing maybe just a file on your local machine, you can send a link to somewhere, uh, like on a database somewhere, and it'll update the data on a live basis every uh, whatever, like whatever uh, delay you set your event timer to. Walking through the process like before, and initializing and uh, restarting. So with workflow number four, which I call the data science API, I'm gonna make data scientists into data engineers. Because usually when you build a model, you're waiting for somebody else to deploy it into production. So why don't you just do it yourself? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a model and pickle that model and then create an API around it. And then that API takes in our input bars and when we send it in, it's gonna output a prediction. Go back to the terminal. So here I have uh, some IPython notebooks. We can just, uh, just show you that really quickly. So here I'm just uh, pulling in my dependencies, loading the data set, splitting it into the test and training set, fitting a KNN, a K-nearest neighbors, pickling my model, and then I'm just playing around here just to show, uh, sort of see if, how to load the data. I should take this part and I put it into a script that I push into, uh, into the container. And so we also have a requirements file. I'll just uh, take a look at that. 
And that's, those are all the things that we need to pre reproduce our API. And so let's just go to the Docker file and see, sort of see what's going on there. So like before, building off Python 363, I'm uh, setting my working directory, copying in the contents of my current directory into the working directory, pip installing my requirements file. I'm sure you guys see a pattern here. Uh, exposing the port and doing the same thing with entry point as CMD as I was doing before. So we'll just go back to the terminal and run this container, get out of here and get some drinks. So we'll do docker run. Want to connect our port. I think this is 5,000. Let me just double check that. And now my process is running. So let's, uh, let's go back to uh, one of the Jupyter notebooks I had. So this one I'm just using request to send it a sample data point and get a prediction. I'm, I just made up a data point. I expected one. I got one. So we can sort of see it's working. Just walking through the commands like we did before. Uh, that's pretty much about it. So now you're probably wondering how, what, uh, what are next steps. Go on the Docker website. There are a couple of really good uh, resources how to install Docker and their Getting Started Guide is great. If you're into Pluralsight, check out Nigel Poulton's Docker Deep Dive. It's a really good resource. Surprisingly, CenturyLink has a good resource as well. And I just want to make everybody aware of an open source project called Pachyderm. Pachyderm allows you to uh, pipeline and containerize your machine learning pipeline. So you can have like your cleaning in one container, your fitting in another container, and your predictions in another container. And it'll all pipeline those together. That's pretty much it for me, a little acknowledgments. Uh, I will take your questions.